Dr. Lawrence Chatters currently serves as the Executive Associate Athletic Director for Strategic Initiatives, also doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work at the University of Nebraska. He oversees the department's, the athletic department's efforts in those respective areas while also serving as a senior administrator advising the director of athletics. Dr. Chatters has also worked as an academic advisor, course instructor, and mental health counselor with focused efforts and experience in students' mental, social, and emotional health. Dr. Chatters graduated from Middle University in 2002 with a degree in psychology. He has been a licensed mental health practitioner since 2006. And he's also an active member of the Synod's Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion team. Yes, we have a Jedi team. As a member of the Synod's Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion uh, Committee, we welcome him to share with us some reflections on the work that he does uh, in his career and as part of that team. Dr. Chatters, welcome. All right, so thank you very much for this, uh, this invitation to speak with you all today. I really appreciate this opportunity. And uh, before I get started, I just want to acknowledge someone who I was able to travel west with today. Uh, my wife of 18 years, Katie Chatters, is here as well, so I just want to acknowledge her. She's, she's been with me on this wonderful journey ever since we, uh, we met at Midland Lutheran College back in 2001, and so it's, it's been an adventure. I'll just put it that way. Um, Thank you so much for the opportunity to reflect with you all today on some of the current issues that we're all experiencing in our country, and also some things that I would imagine are having an impact within your uh, congregations. I wanted to spend some time with you today just talking a little bit about my personal story and how it intersects with uh, being Lutheran, and then I also wanted to share with you all some of the important foundational concepts I believe to be behind our ability. And I'm going to really call you in today as I talk about this work and I talk about our ability to make change in this world. I feel that it is incumbent upon all of us to acknowledge our responsibility to continuously make progress. And so I'll talk to you all about a number of those foundational concepts, and then I'll finish off by talking a little bit about football. All right, so I'm going to take it back to the beginning, first of all, and I'll tell you just a little bit about my story so you can get to know me. And again, some of these intersectionalities I have uh, that really drive my work and who I am and what I do. So first of all, I'll tell you that I was born in New Mexico. And my father was in the Air Force when I was born. And so he was in the early part of his career. I love to talk about my, my father because he's someone who means a lot to me. And he really set the standard for me when it came to understanding what work ethic is. Because every single morning of the weekday, he would wake up, he'd put on the same uniform. It was very, very discreetly pressed and beautiful. And I can remember his uh, battle dress uniform, they call them BDUs, the camouflage they used to wear. Those things used to be so stiff, you could stand them up on their own, you know? He was a sharp man, and my dad really laid the foundation for me of what work and hard work is and commitment to something and patriotism. And that really is something that I'll always be grateful for him for helping me understand those foundational components. So I was born in New Mexico, and I was born with, I call it the trifecta. So first and foremost, I was born with a condition called albinism. So albinism is basically, uh, from a scientific perspective, lack of pigment in the skin, uh, lack of pigment in the eyes. So I was born with albinism to two darker complected parents, and I came out with very, very light, and when I was born, very white skin. And so the joke I tell about that is that I was the second child born with albinism in my family. So my dad and mom played a joke on the doctor and pretended like they had no idea what was going on. So anyways, born with albinism, 
uh, I also was born with a pretty substantial vision issue. And so when I was born, I was born legally blind. And so, you know, you all know that the, the big chart that you look at every time you go to the doctor, everybody knows that there's an E at the top. I didn't know that until I figured out that there was an E at the top. And that's how bad my vision was without my glasses. So I started wearing glasses when I was very young. And then the third thing, the trifecta part was I was born with asthma. So, um, you know, that's one of those things that unfortunately growing up as a young kid and wanting to go outside and play and really enjoy myself, you know, asthma caused some complications with that. And so I like to think of myself at birth as what I call an ugly unicorn. I was very myth mythologically, you know, mystical, but at the same time, nobody really wanted to play with me. So it was a challenging youth. Okay. And of course I can be, I can laugh about it now, but when I was in the throes of it, it was really tough because one of the things I was dealing with at a young age was being different. And we all know that being different can be difficult. And as I moved from North Carolina, which I moved to after New Mexico, over to Germany, and then from Germany to Florida and Florida to Nebraska and moved around all these different places, every time I would be somewhere new, I would have to really explain to everyone who I was and what I was. And that's a difficult thing to do. Every single time new people meet you, they want to understand you. They want to ask lots of questions. They want to get to know who you are and why you are the way that you are. And as young children, we have this curiosity that really makes people ask questions. So I would say probably the first 10 years of my life, I really struggled with my self-esteem. I felt like, why was I made this way? Like, I cannot see well. I cannot really do all the things that the other kids do. I look different from even my parents. Why was I made this way? Like, what exactly is this all about? Because this isn't fun. I was bullied a lot growing up. I dealt with a lot of those challenges and it just became a part of my narrative that I didn't like myself. So my self-esteem was really, really low. And as I think back now, one of the things that really helped me move my self-esteem forward was this exceptionally strong woman in my life, my mother, who is originally from Trinidad and Tobago. She's Caribbean. And so she would never let me feel sorry for myself. If I would come home and I would have been struggling with bullying at school or something, she'd lift me up. She'd say, don't worry about it. They just don't really know who you are. You're an amazing kid. I know that. Your father knows that. You're amazing. But I didn't know that. And I didn't believe it because for some reason, the kids didn't think that I was amazing. They thought that I was someone that they should make fun of all the time, right? So I was really trying to come to terms with all of these challenges that I was dealing with. And, you know, as I think back on my journey, as I kind of finally moved to Nebraska back in 1994, I was really still trying to figure out where my place was in the grand scheme of things. I moved to Nebraska. My dad was, again, stationed here. He was stationed up at Offutt, and I just started high school. And for me, that was really important because I was hopefully going to have an opportunity, unlike any of my siblings to that point, to maybe do all four of my years of high school at one place. So none of my other siblings had that opportunity until my father finally retired from the Air Force because they kept moving us around. So imagine the instability that comes with that, the anxiety that comes with that, the challenge of having to describe to people who you are, what you are, maybe not even knowing fully who you are and having that confidence. So I came to Nebraska, and this is where I feel the story gets a chance to turn around, because this is where, right here in Nebraska, I had the opportunity to find myself in a number of different ways. I started junior ROTC at Bellevue West. I started something called Drill Team. We would march in unison. We were a team. We were a close team, and we did things together. And finally, because of my abilities to do well in that sport or that activity, I started to gain some respect. And so, by the way, I was young for my grade, too. So my mom put me in school early. So I was always smaller than all the other kids, too. So that made things even tougher, right? So started high school, got into ROTC, junior ROTC, started drill team, started to finally find myself, gain a little weight, get a little taller, get a little stronger and bigger. And one of the other things that really changed my life when I was in high school was the opportunity to see my older sister go off to college. Because, you know, 
both her and I, we were absolute bookworms growing up. We read a lot because what else do you do when no one wants to play with you? You just read a lot. So we just read a lot of books and we really, really filled our heads with all this information and these dreams about what we could possibly be. And so when my sister went off to college and I saw that she was going to further her education, you know, she was a part of a program at the time that was uh, started by Midland Lutheran College that they were providing scholarships to minorities to come to the university or the college at the time because they didn't have many minorities at the, at the college. And there were some minorities there, but a lot of them had gone to Midland as a result of sports. And so neither my sister nor I were really that great in sports. And so we were really great on the academic side. So she got a scholarship to go to Midland. And I'll never forget going to Midland to visit her and seeing how happy she was and seeing how she had finally been able to find her way because she struggled with the same things that I struggled with as well. Because like I said, my sister also was born with albinism and a vision issue. But when she got to Midland, somehow she was able to come into her own and really soar. And what I recognized when I saw her doing that, someone who was very much like me, I started to think maybe I can do this. And it was amazing to see her grow and really, really start to take on additional challenges. And then I started to get stronger. So then finally, the opportunity to go off to college came along. And I'll never forget, because as I talk about all these intersectionalities in my life, I want you to understand some of the limitations that people have dealt with and some of you all have dealt with that are a result of not having certain privileges. So again, my sister got a full ride scholarship to go to Midland. It was amazing for my family because the one thing I didn't even realize until uh, you know, probably about, I don't know, it was about a year ago, I was down at my mom's house in Florida and I was looking back at my dad's pay stubs. We were poor. <laughs> I, I never really knew that. I always thought that we were doing okay because my dad was a pretty high ranking enlisted uh, person in the military. But with just him being the only one working and my mom wasn't working so she could raise us five children, we, we weren't really doing that well. So there weren't really many opportunities for us to go to college. So my sister went off to Midland, she got a scholarship, and I was a little more imaginative when it came to where I wanted to go. I applied to a number of places, I'll never forget, I actually got accepted into Cornell, which at the time I had no idea what that meant. I really didn't. I, I remember running to my mom though and saying, you know, mommy, guess what? I got into Cornell and I got a scholarship too. She said, well, how much is the scholarship? I said, well, it's supposed to be $5,000 a year. <laughs> If you know anything about Cornell, $5,000 doesn't really do much for you there. Uh, you may be able to share a room with two other people. Um, but she, she was very kind. She said, that's great. You know, let's keep looking. <laughs> so we kept looking. I got into a number of other places. I can remember, you know, that, that I got into other places. Where I really wanted to go, though, was the Air Force Academy. Because I wanted to be just like my dad. I wanted to be a pilot. Now, mind you, I already told you that I was born legally blind, so there was absolutely no way they were going to let me fly anything. But I'll tell you what, my mom was such an amazing person that she let me go through the whole process. I actually received a uh, recommendation. I think it was from Ben Nelson at the time. I went through the whole process, and then I successfully failed the physical. Okay? So I was really, you know, I was really ready to go to the Air Force Academy. I had everything in line. Um, and so when that dream went out the window, which it never actually came through the door, but um, I said, well, gosh, what about this Midland place? You know, and so uh, fortunately, I'd gotten the same scholarship that my sister got to go to Midland. And there I was off to this Midland Lutheran College. So I tell people that the only Lutheran in my house as I was growing up was Martin Luther King Jr.'s picture on the wall in my house. <laughs> there was no Lutheran in my household, so I'm not going to stand up here and say that I was raised in the church because I wasn't, okay? Uh, but what I will tell you is that when I finally went to Midland and I had the opportunity to follow in my sister's footsteps, I started to learn uh, a lot more about what being Lutheran is, is all about. And it really changed my life in so many different ways. My sister had gone there. She was successful. She had gotten involved in choir and acting. And I had never done that stuff in high school. That was beyond me in high school. I was just doing ROTC and wrestling. But when I got to college, I joined the choir. I got involved in acting. 
I did a number of wonderful things because this idea of a liberal arts education was so compelling that you needed to try a little bit of everything. And so I started doing that. And there was this awesome pastor there named Pastor Jim Malang. And he really continued to push me in my faith in a really positive way. And he felt like I had something to offer. So he pushed me and he challenged me to be a part of the chapel services and to learn more about the religion and through my class that I was taking at the time called Odyssey. If any of you went to Midland, that was just something that everybody had to do. It was an Odyssey course where you learned a lot about a lot. And I learned about Martin Luther and I learned about the journey and I learned about what it means to be radical in some ways, right? I learned about change. I learned about conviction. I learned about vocation, all these different concepts that we hold dear. I started to learn about these things and it really opened my mind even more to my possibilities, regardless of the things that I was struggling with. And so being at Midland after that freshman year that I was there and I'd really been introduced to the Lutheran faith and, you know, had run into these individuals at the uh, dining hall from this camp called Carol Joy Holling. And it seemed like, seemed like a great opportunity. So, I mean, I didn't want to go home that summer because, you know, you have this freedom, you don't want to give it away. So I decided to be a camp counselor at Carol Joy Holling that summer. And one of the requirements was not necessarily being Lutheran, I guess. I mean, I, as I look back on it now, I was wondering, as I think back on it, how did they entrust me to be a person who could witness to these young people who are in their faith journey, who are going to the camp through their church or having opportunities to participate in vacation Bible school as we went across the state of Nebraska? How did they entrust me with my one year of Lutheran knowledge to go out and really witness to these young people? And I think back on it and I'm thinking, Wow, that was a pretty inclusive camp. They trusted me because of the charisma that I had and, you know, honestly, needing people to work at the camp, right? <laughs> they entrusted me to come in and become a part of their organization. And again, it was another opportunity where it ratcheted up my faith and I started to really believe in this idea of confidence. So I was at that camp that summer. It was an amazing experience for me. That furthered not only my faith, but it also furthered my, uh, my conviction to work with individuals from all different walks of life. Uh, that summer, we actually started this uh, camp called Crosswalk, and we drove all the way out to Axtell, Nebraska. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is like in the middle of nowhere, right? <laughs> I know there's some people from Axtell in here. I'm just, you know, but I'm just saying, I was out there and I was like, wow, how did I end up in this small town? And one of the neat things that I experienced that summer was the goodness of the people all across our state. People took us in when we would actually go out into their communities. They would feed us for the entire week, provide us with a place to stay. And honestly, that hospitality is something else that has to this day continue to give me faith that we as a people across this state are absolutely open to accepting new people. It was back during that time that, again, maybe to that point, I had been the only African-American pe person in these people's houses, but they welcomed me and they allowed me to be a part of their community. So that's where I really kind of fell in love with this idea of small towns in Nebraska and just how wonderful those places can be. So very fortunately for me, as, as God would have it, there was a, a young woman who would come to Midland through her church with a scholarship my senior year, who would be the person that I would eventually meet and marry. And so that's the other thing that I really credit, you know, the Lutheran church with is helping me find a wife, which is amazing. So, <laughs> so, but uh, that's where the story you all really starts to enter this perspective of difference and coming to terms with difference because my girlfriend at the time wife now was is from west point nebraska and 
you know, her family and their life, the way they grew up, you know, they were used to, uh, you know, being in their community and going to their church and having family around and everything else. But what I can say is that, you know, I'm pretty certain that I was one of the first people of color to ever walk into their home. And I just so happened to be this guy that she liked too. So, you know, I could, I'll never forget that first Thanksgiving when I was there and it was like, it was awesome. All the family was there and everything else. And then I always tell the, this, you know, everybody this part of the story because it's important. She came back to school after Thanksgiving and I expect her to tell me like how awesome it was, you know, that like I'd been able to go there and her parents met me and everything. And she said, I'm sorry to tell you this, but my dad said that we have to break up. I was like, really? I was really taken aback because, you know, I was like, OK, like and, and, and what do you think? <laughs> you know, what are your thoughts on that? She said, well, I don't I don't want to break up. I think we should stay together. I was like, all right, great. We're going to stay together then. But what happened is that, you know, I think her dad thought that it was just kind of a bit of a phase, you know, that she had just brought me home for Thanksgiving. But this wasn't going to be long term. You know, maybe it was just, you know, an experiment of sorts. But. I sure wasn't going anywhere, you know, and she didn't necessarily want me to go anywhere. So that started off a very difficult time in our relationship. And what I can tell you is that because of our cultural differences, her parents didn't think that we should be together. They thought, you know, well, she can't find a guy around here or somewhere else that's not so different from her and us. Do we really have to deal with all of this difference in our family? Should we have to deal with this? Is this even right? You know, these were some questions I think that they were asking themselves. And she was only 19 at the time. So it was kind of also like, well, she's only 19. Like, you know, it's, there's many years still that she could find someone else. And this isn't, this isn't it, right? So we stayed together. And very fortunately, we fought through some of the really negative things that came our way as a result of that. And again, this is just when I was kind of getting to the end of my college career at Midland, and I was the I was the Senate president. I had done really well academically. I thought I was, you know, I, at the time I felt pretty confident. That shook my confidence to its core, because the one thing that I couldn't control about myself, my cultural background, was the one thing that now someone had found issue with. And what I'm telling you at this point is that that was the first time in my life. As a black, with albinism, legally blind, in Nebraska person that I had ever really experienced that, that type of racism. That was the first time. I hadn't heard anything. I hadn't experienced anything else while I was at Midland. That was the first time. And it was the thing that I couldn't change about myself. So what I'm telling you all in that is just when people do struggle with some of these issues that they find they cannot change these things about themselves, their culture, their ethnicity, those different types of things. Imagine how difficult that is. They can't have entrance somewhere because of something that they can't change about themselves. Or they don't have access to something because there's something that they can't change about themselves. So keep that in mind as we continue through this journey. So I finished college and went off to Lincoln. And when I went to Lincoln, I joined a counseling psychology program at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And, you know, honestly, one of the other things that was really cultivated in me in my experience at Carol Joy Holling was this idea of helping people. I love to help people. It was something that just brought me great joy and it was rewarding for me. I loved helping people. So I decided to go into the psychology field. So I went into a master's program. And in my master's program, I learned even more about not only helping people in human behavior, but also this, these concepts of being multiculturally competent. And to that point, what I want you to understand, which as you all are, are on your journeys, I hadn't really thought too much about some of these concepts because to that point, for me personally, the way that my world had been curated, besides some of the other stuff that I talked about in my youth, I felt like I had it easy. You know, I was academically ahead, you know, I was I needed to do, I thought that I had all access to the world. I don't really think about my culture or some of these other factors as things that were holding me back. But then I started to understand more so what history has provided for me and some of the limitations that may be out there. And as I started to learn more about those things, you know, I'll say that I, I really became more aware of my cultural background. 
by the way, just to kind of catch you up on the story with my my wife at the at that point in time by then, when our first child came along, all of a sudden things changed. A child changes everything, they say, right? So our beautiful daughter came along and now all of a sudden the grandparents, they wanted to have her for the weekend, you know, we started going back a little bit more and things started to get better. We were still on our journey. And so I finished my master's in counseling psychology and then I started to work at the state penitentiary. That was a journey in and of itself. We know that the correctional system right now is, is over full and uh, challenging, but at the time, you know, I was the only person of color that was a mental health practitioner in the entire state. And I was excited to sit down with some of the people who would come in and visit with me, who would see me on the yard and say, Hey chatters, I'm going to come see you. You know, I'm like, all right, all right. You know, so they'd come and sit down and we talk and we have these great conversations as providing therapy for them. But what I started to realize in those conversations was that some of these things that I'd really learned about and seen around, you know, in some of my books and everything, some of these aspects of what people consider to be institutional racism and things like that, uh, you know, disproportionate, whatever. I started to see some of those things manifest in these people who were sitting in front of me. And I thought to myself, I really would like to make more of an impact in these individual spaces. And in order to do that, I probably need to reach them earlier. I need to reach them when they're still impressionable and younger. And so as I learned from them there in the prison, by the way, and that was another great lesson for me in this understanding that people's circumstances sometimes dictate the choices that they have to make in their life. And so with all of those things in mind, I decided to go back to school to get my PhD. And so I ended up going back to school, um, finished my PhD, I'll kind of leave out a bit of a gap of time in there because it took me a really, really long time to get it, but I finished it. And so I finished that in 2018 and then I went off to Penn State uh, to do a postdoc. And what I'll say is that to, when I went off to do my postdoc, it was 2018. So this is pre-pandemic and other major challenges that have impacted our, our world of late, okay? So I went out to Pennsylvania and, um, you know, this really odd thing happened to me when I was out there in Pennsylvania. I started really, you know, doing a lot of introspection and trying to figure out, is this really what I want to do after I've spent all this time getting a PhD, right? So like, is this really what I want to do? You know, having all of these existential crises and stuff. And, and uh, you know, I thought to myself, gosh, this isn't what I want to do. I don't necessarily want to just sit behind closed doors and wait for somebody to make an appointment to come see me. I want to get back on the ground. I want to kind of be more like that camp counselor that I was, you know, with people interacting with them, you know, get my hands dirty in the work and everything else. And so through that process of thinking about that, I started looking for a job. And I'll never forget when I saw the, the announcement for the job back at this place now called Midland University. <laughs> And I was like, wow, that's a sign. Vice president for student affairs. I was like, oh my goodness, this is, this is my job. This is my calling. I want to be working with students. I want, to, I want to once again have that opportunity to help shape people in that way. So I applied. I ended up uh, very fortunately getting that job. So we had just moved out to Pennsylvania. We turned back around, moved back to Nebraska. Like I said about my wife, it's been a journey, right? You know? So we moved back to Nebraska and I started at Midland. And while I was at Midland as a vice president for student affairs, one of the things I first recognized is that the place still had this wonderful feel for me because I had really grown while I was there in my faith and also just in my idea of, you know, how to gain confidence as a young man. And I was able to help really facilitate that for the young people that I was working with. And the other things that happened while I was at Midland were we had these, we had a hundred year flood and then a hundred year pandemic in a span of like two or three years. And so talk about really coming into my own when it comes to leadership. <laughs> I mean, the, the pandemic and the flood, it really, it really shook my confidence again, but through all of that and also going back to Midland and once again, getting involved in my spirituality and deepening that. I never forgot the promise that we all know about, which is God's promise that we're all going to be okay and that we should, we should have faith, 
that we should leave some of those things to him and his power and that we would be okay. And that's one of the things I really had to come to terms with because all those things that you can't control, you really have to have faith that those things will in fact work out. So getting into the work at Midland, I was, uh, you know, it was 2020 and uh, George Floyd had been murdered. And, you know, it was really, again, this awakening of our country, in my opinion, when it comes to some of the injustices that happen to the people uh, that we don't think of often. And then I was named chief diversity officer there, and I started really putting all of these different components to work that I'd learned not only in my program, but also in my life to help support our campus, go about this process of reconciliation and healing. And I found myself really enjoying that work. And the reason that I really enjoyed that work is because for the first time in my life, I was in a position to encourage other people to think about those who they forget and to think about some of the things that we really are under the surface, these challenges that we have between each other, that if we actually were to bring those things up and have discussions about them, that we could work through those things. But we seem to brush those things under the carpet. I was able to do that work. And I was doing that work um, and really enjoying it. And then last summer, right around this time, this position came open at Nebraska in the athletic department. And, you know, they wanted me to do that work at Nebraska. And what I will tell you is that I was very happy at Midland. I was truly enjoying my work there. But when I thought about the prospect of being able to impact one of the major institutions of this state and also have an impact on people across the state, that was something that I really could not pass up. It was a really great opportunity. And I felt all of the things that I had done to that point had prepared me. And so then I took this role as the executive, so actually my first title was Senior Associate Athletic Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. So I got hired on Wednesday, and then Moose gets fired on Friday. So I was like, whoa, what's going on here? You know, like maybe this is a sign, right? So, you know, I'll never forget that, uh, you know, I got a call at the time and um, it was uh, the guy who had hired me and he said, you know, we're still going to move forward with your position, you know? And I was like, well, great, because I already kind of put my resignation on this other side over here. But um, he said, we're going to move forward with it, but uh, we're going to have a new AD and, you know, things are probably going to change a bit. And so I just wanted to let you know that. So, if, you know, if you want to stay where you are, that is totally fine. We will not, you know, it's not a problem. Just you let us know how you'd like to proceed. And it was at that moment that I thought, you know, gosh, you like, as I think back on my journey, as I think back on all these wonderful things that I've had an opportunity to do and all these experiences I've had the chance to have, it's always taken a certain sense of adventure to keep going. So I said, you know what, I'm just going to stick with it. And then they named Trev Alberts as the new AD. And what I can tell you about working with Trev so far is that he is a dreamer, just like I am. He believes in me and he believes in the work that I'm doing. And he gives me the opportunity to really um, imagine what is possible through athletics in that space. And so since then, I got promoted to executive associate AD for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And more recently, I got promoted again to executive associate AD for strategic initiatives. And I get the opportunity in my work now to think about how through this ideal of athletics and this concept of coming together as a team, how we can critically move forward this idea of inclusion. And let me tell you, it's hard to do because first and foremost, I have 600 student athletes that I have to work with from 29 different countries, 48 different states, 24 different teams, all different aspects of different specs that we work with. And I have to try to help those young people feel like they made the right decision when they came here to continue their athletic and academic and social and personal pursuits. That's hard work. I also have over 300 full-time employees that are committed to working for Nebraska athletics that come from different backgrounds that want to feel like they've chosen the right place to work. And then 
I have everyone else across the state who thinks that Nebraska should be a certain way or do certain things. And I'll tell you, one of the things I've recognized that is important is when you cross the state line in Nebraska, whether you be young or old, you automatically get handed a coaching endorsement. <laughs> so, so right away, right away, people feel as though they can comment on every single thing that the teams do and everything else. So I, I've, I've noticed that I've come to terms with it, right? But what I will tell you I've learned in my role so far and what I really would like to impart to you all is some of the uh, practical components that you can take um, to the spaces where you have an impact are five things. And I'm going to share those things with you now. The first thing is forgiveness. Forgiveness is incredibly important in any space because it allows us that opportunity to step back be reflective and allow ourselves some grace. So offering forgiveness to others has become incredibly important for me. When I tell you there are some decisions that we've made in the department and I've gotten lots of emails about how ridiculous what we're doing is and how, you know, I've received some pretty bad emails. Um, I have to offer forgiveness to those individuals and I forgive them for a number of reasons. Number one, I know that they truly don't know me and I know that they don't know my heart and I know that they don't understand why I have to do some of the things that I do. I offer them forgiveness. As a matter of fact, there was a guy on uh, Twitter and um, you know, I had, something I'd put up some post or something like that about something inclusive or whatever. And the guy like commented on my, on, on the tweet. He said, this guy is a moron. He said, he has no idea what he's talking about. He wrote the book on critical race theory. He is just, you know, a communist. I mean, he had all kinds of things to say about me. And so through the pain of what I was reading in front of me, I clicked on his uh, name and I started looking at his profile and I realized that we had some mutual friends. And I, I saw one of our mutual friends uh, was a guy who um, was actually in a fraternity that I was in at Midland. And um, I had seen that this guy was friends with him. And so I reached out to him and I said, hey, you know, you had a few choice words to say about me on social media. I was just wondering if if you, uh, if you went to Midland and he said, yeah, actually I went to Midland. I graduated in uh, 2013. I said, I also went to Midland and it looks like, you know, somebody that I know that was there at the time. And this is a very visible person that people that went there that were in that fraternity would know. He said, yeah, I'm also in that fraternity. Kappa Phi. I said, I am too. I'm in Kappa Phi. I said, you know, maybe we should get together for lunch and talk. And he said, Okay, fine. So after having that conversation on uh, social media, I did go to the security person at the university and said, hey, I'm going to be meeting with this guy. I just want you to kind of be around the corner. And if he slaps me in the face, you should probably step in, right? So anyways, we met. We had a discussion about what happened online. And when everything was said and done, he apologized. And I said, you know, you have to be careful what you say on social media because you never know, honestly, what people are going through on the other side of it. You have no idea who those people are. And he said, you know, I'm really sorry. I just kind of really go off sometimes on social media. You know, I, I think I probably need to get some help. You know, I agreed. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> so anyways, we met, come to find out we were both in the same fraternity. He graduated from Midland a few years after me, and it was just this aha moment for me. Forgiveness. It opened the door to that entire interaction. And sometimes also, we have to ask for forgiveness of people that we may unfortunately use a stereotype against do something that they don't 
think is something positive that we result of who they are, what their cultural background is. It is important for us to ask for forgiveness for our discretions against people when it comes to these components of understanding people who are different from us. And I've had people ask me for forgiveness because they didn't know some of the things that I was struggling with as I was growing up. They had no idea what type of detrimental impact their words had on me as we've met later in life. And they say, will you please forgive me? I I had no idea that this is what you were going through. When they see me tell my story and talk about some of the challenges that I dealt with. So sometimes we have to ask for that forgiveness as well. So as you think about the people that you are close to, that you work with in the communities that you're around, I want you to keep this idea of forgiveness close by, which I'm sure you all do. Help people to understand that they must ask for it and they must give it. Advocacy. Advocacy is something that is incredibly important to me. Ever since I've had the opportunity to stand up and speak for someone else, which in my family was my older sister and my younger sister because they would always get into arguments and stuff, I had to advocate for my little sister with my older sister and vice versa. So I started that from a really young age. Then I kind of moved on to, you know, doing that for other people. I started to understand that my voice had power, especially for those who don't have a voice and whose voices are ignored. Advocacy is incredibly important. And I think that anyone in this space that has any power, whatever power you have, whatever privilege you have, we should also be advocates. We should really push ourselves to think about who doesn't have a voice, who doesn't have a place at the table, and we should think of them and we should bring them into the space when we can. And if they can't make it into the space, just our thought about them and our understanding of their struggle and their marginalization should push us to be advocates for those people. What I found is that when I'm advocating for other people, I find great joy in that. And I have the privilege and power in some spaces to really speak up for people and make a difference. I encourage you all to think about how you can become better advocates. And if there are people who are around you who are struggling to deal with some of these issues in our world and they're, they're not understanding certain things and they're struggling, we should encourage them to become advocates. Because traditionally, when you are thinking about other people, you're doing good work. When I think about intentionality, let me tell you a little bit about intentionality because, you know, intentionality is moving beyond the performative And thinking more about how can you do something the right way for the right reason at the right time. Okay, think about that. So when we talk about some of these different things that we try to do when we're working on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it's X history month, and we reach out to the one person we might know and say, hey, is there any way that we could get together and have you come do this, that, or the other? That's not very intentional. Okay, it's not the right time because it just happens to be the one month that they get for the year. Maybe it's not the right person because they're like, I don't really want to be in that space. And maybe it's not the right reason because you want to feel better. When we are intentional, we constantly think about ways that we can compound the positive and move toward the transformational. How can you compound the positive? Well, I'll give you some examples. How can we be intentional? So when I first started working at Nebraska in the athletic department, one of the things that was really on my heart was this wonderful thing called Husker football and the fact that there really is not an opportunity for people that don't have money to participate in Husker football. I mean, if you don't have money and you can't afford a ticket and you can't be a part of the Sea of Red, then you're not so excited about the Sea of Red. You may watch it on TV but you're not a part of the sea of red. And I thought about it and I said, you know, gosh, we, I'll tell you, this is the intentionality component. So we had like 2000 tickets left for the first game of the year because there's a, there's kind of a performance issue going on, right? (laughs) 
<laughs> so we're sitting in the executive staff room and I'm new and all of these executives are sitting around in that space. And, and Trev says, if anyone can think of a way for us to move these 2000 tickets, that would just be great because the sellout streak is going to come to an end. And I hate to tell you guys, it might come to an end. So I thought about it for a long time and I thought about how could we be intentional about this? And I said, you know, I went to him and I said, Trev, what do you think about creating an opportunity where we could have other people purchase those tickets, but then we can make sure that those tickets got to people who can't afford a ticket? He was like, you know what? Okay, let me, let me, let me chew on that a little bit. So he went out to dinner with some folks. He had actually gone to an away game and came back and said, you know what? I presented this idea to a couple of people, and guess what? They bought all 2,000 of those tickets for kids. I was like, oh my goodness, are you serious? He said, yes. So this whole idea that you have, go make it happen, right? Right? <laughs> and so, ladies and gentlemen, so was born the red carpet experience that started last year, and What's amazing is that it was intentional. Number one, it saved the sellout streak. Okay. Number two, it provided individuals who couldn't afford a ticket the opportunity to not only go to the game, but to go with their family. And number three, it provides everybody that actually makes a donation to that program feel absolutely great that they are contributing to something bigger than themselves because they want someone else to have the opportunity to participate in something that they get a chance to participate in. And it's amazing that every single person that comes into the stadium and gets to be a part of that sea of red, I think they feel more included in this state. That is something amazing that we have the opportunity to do in this state is to come together like that in these large numbers and absolutely be on the edge of our seats until the last couple of plays of the game. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, it's awesome to be there. And I thought, and there's many other people across the state that feel like everybody should have access to that. Now, let me tell you, if I had just said, you know what, we are going to start a communist program that Everybody should be able to go to a game and everyone's going to get that chance. And that's why you should put your money here. Nobody would have done it. Right. But instead, the red carpet experience was born. And guess what? We expanded that same program from football to volleyball, to basketball, to baseball and softball. Every ticketed program at Nebraska is now open and available to everyone in this state because of intentionality. So it's pretty awesome. And I'm really proud of that. And what it really took was people's gratitude and them wanting to make a difference in other people's lives. So when I think about truth, truth is central to everything. It is central. We have to seek truth. And when I think about truth, I think of what are some of the challenging things that we're dealing with in this day and age that makes it very difficult for us to truly impact the people in our spaces that we love who have these viewpoints that are very difficult sometimes to understand and difficult to manage. It is because we are getting farther and farther, unfortunately, away from truth in our media. There are sound bites. There are things that are just absolutely false that are being proliferated in our society. We have to find the truth. So when you all are working with those people that you're close to and you're trying to help them understand differing perspectives, we have to help them find truth. Truth is central to everything. And as we continue to battle against some of these challenges, and I'll be honest, I mean, they're ha it's happening to everyone. Like if you have people in your life that you love that are on, you know, some of these social media platforms. I don't think some of them understand what these algorithms are that are behind the scenes that are pulling them to different sites every single time they get on and showing them assets. It's hard. It's hard to talk with somebody and have a conversation with someone around issues that they don't 
understand what the truth is about those issues. And I think what eventually some folks would like to have is that there potentially is no truth. That we are all kind of stuck in some shade of a falsehood and there's no way to really get to the root of it. But I think all of us in the room know what the truth is, right? The truth, the way and the life, right? There's something central to that component of our faith that is incredibly important to us all, but recognize that there are threats to even that component of our lives. So we have to help people find the truth. You all do that. You're in a space where you have to understand that truth and you have to really be loud about it and supportive of it when you find it and when you can show it to others. Finally, humility. One of the most important parts of my work is humbling myself consistently to understand that truthfully, I don't know anything. I really don't. I am constantly in a position of learning. I have to be humble to learn. I have to be humble to approach situations where I need to gain more information. If I don't know you, but all I know is how you look or potentially how you dress or where you're from, I really don't know you. I just know something about you. I have to humble myself and utilize humility to be in a position of learning consistently to be taught by the people around me who they are, what they're about, what they believe in, how I can help them. As a psychologist, and that's what my doctorate is in, I am in an ultimate position of humility when I step into a space with a client because it is them who, they are the person who is the expert on them. I just provide you know, a sounding board really and support Sometimes I'll provide some interventions and things of that nature, but I have to humble myself to understand their journey. And I think that's incredibly important that we ask the people around us who are struggling with some of these cultural issues that are happening in our society to humble themselves and find humility so that maybe what they see is just what they see as opposed to what it truly is. They need to continue looking to find out more, they need to maybe talk with somebody who has that experience to understand why that person has that experience. Or they need to read more and understand more and seek out more truth. That's challenging to do because remember, so long as you browse through Facebook for a while, you can earn a PhD. <laughs> right? We noticed that with the pandemic. Everybody had an MD all of a sudden. It was just, you know, this very odd thing, you know, like, wow, you're making comments about whether or not we should do this or that. Okay. Which medical school did you go to? Facebook you. Okay. So we have to encourage people to humble themselves. We have to be humble. Through humility, we learn and we are given opportunities to have access to people's true stories, find out their truth understand how we can be intentional about providing support for those individuals around us rather than doing things that are performative. We can be advocates and we can also utilize forgiveness. So we have forgiveness, advocacy, intentionality, truth, and humility, faith. That is something that has really driven my journey is this idea, this concept of faith, knowing, understanding that things can be better. But through faith and with faith, of course, we still have to put in the action and the work behind it. And that's one of the things I've consistently done all my life is I've had faith, but while I've had faith, I've still worked very hard. And I've tried to make sure that through utilizing these different components that I've shared with you as you hear my story and you learn about my journey, I've just tried to really, honestly, just, you know, be a, a decent person. And I know 
from all of the time that I've spent here in this wonderful state of Nebraska that there's a lot of great, decent people across this state. There's a lot of wonderful people. So to finish up a few stories that I started telling, my wife's dad and I are really, really close now. He is an awesome man. He's a farmer. He has a cattle operation. You know, right now he's planting, you know, good old Nebraska stuff, right? He's a great guy. What I recognize now about him is that through our journey together, now I've known him, it's been about 20 years now. You know, he was just, he was, he was nervous about change. He was nervous about, uh, what was changing so rapidly in his life and his daughter's life. And I'll tell you what, now I have two daughters. My oldest is 17. My youngest is 13. And she may go back to college and tell that guy that they need to break up too. <laughs> Depends on if I like him or not, you know? But, uh, so I understand that part now. Uh, but yeah, we're really close and uh, it's been really awesome to get to know him because he's a good man. He's a good German Lutheran man who grew up in the Lutheran church. And uh, that's been a consistent theme throughout my life is that I've been able to, you know, get to know people. They've been able to get to know me. And it's been an amazing journey. And that red carpet experience that I told you about, we just found out yesterday that a family here in Nebraska plans to endow that program with a $250,000 gift to make sure that all students across this state, if they are not able to afford to go to a game, will get an opportunity to go to a Husker game. So it's pretty amazing stuff, right? So to finish up, what I'll say to you all is that yes, we are facing absolutely difficult times We've always faced difficult times. We are resilient. We are resilient people. We have goodness in our hearts. We have our faith. Through forgiveness, advocacy, intentionality, truth, and humility, as I mentioned at the beginning, each and every one of us in this space are responsible for helping to make a difference in our country. We can change someone next to us. We can change our congregation. We can help them see that they, too, can take on this work and they can move this thing forward. I've been very fortunate to benefit from many wonderful people in my life. Some of those people are in this very room right now, and I appreciate them for what they provided for me. The opportunity to see more potential in myself and to truly find my roots in faith. So I really appreciate the time to talk to you all today. I hope I provided you with just a few tools or opportunities to think about how you can be instrumental in moving this thing forward. And it's been awesome to spend some time with you this, this evening. Thank you very much.